It is the beginning of our summer lit series, but do not mistake this for your typical corporate bookstore event or your typical corporate nonprofit event. This is part of a huge network. So not only will you experience one of the leading intellectuals in the country, which I'm going to preview him right now and give him a longer introduction a little bit, but Dr. Adapi, of course, will be our main person today. And we lead minds in the country as an intellectual, and I'm proud that he's also here in Houston and a Chicano. But we are celebrating also our connection with some other organizations as well. And some of our co-sponsors include the Houston Community College System and also the BIPOC Network and Fund, Houston Endowment, KPFT, Harris County Public Library Systems, Arte Publico Press, the offices of Harris County Commissioner Leslie Leones, and also ALMA. And today we are fine-tuning our surveys because ALMA is an organization that is analyzing the Latino art community and writing an important report. I'm proud to serve on the board. We've got two of our colleagues there, Jose Solis and also Gabriela Magana. Thank you both for attending. And I want you to know a couple things. Before I tell you what they're about, um, you know, we've been texting so <laughs> My dear friend was a Libro Traficante, I was staying, of course, this uh, key activist from Baytown. Thank you for coming share applaud. I was staying a big member of Libro Traficante. We were testing each other. He was like, which one is it? I'm like, here it is. Um, that's challenging. It was challenging to find this site, which is why I'm very happy that we're working with Houston Community College. We've got some major events coming up. We've got um, four important events coming up. I'm hiding one that you see in the head there. Um, and why am I telling you this? So nuestra palabra has not invested in a building or a box. And that's probably why we turned 25 this year. We've survived because we were not brought down by what is given to our community. And I mean no disrespect to the few legacy Latino arts organizations that exist, but what is given to our community? Repurposed buildings that are formerly supermarkets. That's what Talento Beligua de Houston was. Repurposed schools that are over 100 years old. I love Mecca. I respect Alice Valdez greatly. She's done a lot with a building that is not state of the art. What does that mean? That means que estamos en casas ajenas. Ningún lugar para mudar. That was a little book that I had when I was a kid. Uh, so as we started to find places, um, we, we went to TBH first, our event on October 15th. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm hiding it from you now. October 15th, we are hosting Sandra Cisneros, special event for Houston, Texas. You like Sandra? You like Sandra? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's going to be a special event. She's coming to, to support Nuestra Palabra and Freedom of Speech. That will be at Talento Bilingue de Houston on Sunday, October 15th. However, Mecca was booked these other nights where our community is thriving. We need places. They get full. We're very happy to be here tonight, but August 16th, this place was booked. So August 16th, you're going to see that we're hosting Cristina Rivera Garza. She just won a Genius MacArthur grant, which is huge. She's also the head of creative writing in Spanish. You can get your PhD in Spanish creative writing at the University of Houston. If you did not know that, that's incredible. She's in charge right there. She has a new book. It's called Liliana's Invisible Summer. Um, we're going to host her at the ballroom at Bayou Place downtown because this site was full. The site was full. Um, that will be 6.30 to 8, same pattern. Um, because we're making you go somewhere else, parking will be a challenge. If you are among the first 100 folks, you will get a free drink. And some free food as well. I said, don't buy it. I said, don't buy it. Uh, <laughs> but my point, though, is that estamos en casas ajenas. We do not have a state-of-the-art 
multi-purpose Latino art center. Y cuesta. It takes a lot of time and energy. No, not even the money. Actually, here was very reasonable prices. They've got a lot of great staff helping us. That was a very reasonable price. Other places cost more. It's just the time and energy calling all these places. And I will tell you this, obviously parking is always an issue. We've had some great events at the Alley Theater. Parking was a big issue there. Um, at the Bayou Place, parking is gonna be an issue. Here, parking is fantastic because it's free right outside. There's a free parking garage across the street. We maybe don't think about those things. There's many of our community members that will think about that. And if parking's gonna be 20 bucks, they may decide not to go. So I just mentioned that because if we had our own place, and when I say we, I don't mean esta palabra, I mean our community. We could count on that place as a regular home for our cultura, and we can plan ahead. Um, another, we will be back here though, on September 25th during Hispanic Heritage Month, and we're gonna give you some books. So Nuestra Palabra received a big read grant. So on Monday, September 25th, we'll be back here, and we're gonna host, of course, um, some Latina leaders, including Harris County Commissioner Leslie Briones, who just got elected. She's awesome. We got some Democrats waving. Hi, yeah, let's round of applause for Leslie Briones. I don't buy the Alex. Staunch Democrat in the house. Um, and then also, we'll be having Delia Garcia, who's the editor of Latina Leadership Lessons, 50 Latina Speak. Her book will be for sale. Included in the book is Lina Hidalgo, who we will invite for the evening, as well as Sylvia Garcia. We're also going to be celebrating our Colombian American authors. So with the grant from the Big Read, we're going to give away 500 copies of the book Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. And as I said, she's Colombian American, so we will be also promoting the Colombian American community, which is very hard to reach. Um, that will be in conjunction with the um, Harris County Library System, and then Tell people why, because not only will the parking be free, we're gonna give them free books, and they're gonna meet some of the leading Latinas, not just in Harris County, but are who are shaping the nation. Um, and then I say all that to introduce the idea that with Alma, I'm very happy to be on the board. I helped co-write a grant with our chair, Carolina Antiriano Weiss, and we received $1 million from Houston Endowment. I always have to tell people I didn't get a penny of that. So, does the board member, you don't get the funding. Um, however, what is powerful is that with that money, we're writing a report on what you need, what you want, in a state-of-the-art, multidisciplinary, Latino art complex. And when I say complex, this is not one building. This is not just for writers, not just for teatro. It is a complex, and we want to know, do you want it to house literature, theater, music? Do you want it to have a live community library in there? Do you need babysitting services? I think we need parking, put that on there. What would you go to see? What kind of experiences do you want? Do you want just cultural? Do you want it all? And if you want it all, put it on that paper because December 2023, we will compile a report that archives and quantifies what is the Latino art community, but then also your input will tell us what the buildings will encompass, what they will look like. Another issue will be where it should be, because that's another key issue. Um, and of course, from there, once we have the report, we're gonna go to start getting the funding for that. And the other thing I want to say then is, the million dollars is just for our intellectual thoughts, our ideas, that report. So today, uh, Mark Cedric, I'm going to ask Mark to raise his hand. Mark is right over there putting up some displays. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> He's going to pass around the survey. If it doesn't get filled out, he will get fired. You know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of create some drama there, sorry. Get a little tension. Uh, but when you see his face, 
I don't want you to say, oh, that's the survey guy. Next event, September 25th, I'm deputizing all of you. If you come back, you're going to tell someone, mira, go get your free book. You see that guy? That's the survey guy. Right? We need you to tell everybody to fill out that survey. And, and from there, too, they're going to keep filling it out and telling more people so that we get all of your input. And when we go advocate for the structure, we're going to say, this many people said they need this. This many people said this is a barrier. And I, I will close with this. So, yes, today we're convening with one of the leading professors and central giants in the country. We're convening as community. But this is one of the steps towards a beautiful complex for our community that we deserve and we demand and we will see. So it begins with you coming up today, thank you for that, filling out that survey. And then at each of these subsequent events, there'll also be more surveys, but then we're also gonna have it for visual arts, theater, and other neighborhoods as well. So I did wanna kind of give you the context for that. And then, of course, we will um, we will keep you posted to that. If you go to the website nuestrapalabra.org, you can get the the rundown of these events. And of course, they all are free. And please do spread the word. So I do now want to give an introduction for our for our dear guest for today. Um, we're going to have him make some remarks, take some questions, and then we'll have a book signing afterwards. I do appreciate folks that have already gotten their books. So some folks are like, I'm not going to wait. I want my book now. <laughs> and that's awesome. <laughs> so that's perfect uh, because this is going to be part of your family library. And right now, we have to really embrace family libraries, public libraries, and underground libraries. We'll talk more about that later. We'll talk more about that later. But right now, um, it gives me great pleasure for us to welcome Dr. Richard Tapia because he is a personal friend of mine. And I say that because he's always been very generous with his time, energy, and intelligence. But you need to realize that he has shaped a generation of leaders in math and science. Other parts of the country, they revere him as thought leader as someone that has created careers and at the same time what I really respect about him besides that is that very community based how to be Chicano and when I see him talking to students he does not put on airs and you can walk by him and think that he's just another faculty member uh, es de nuestra comunidad, muy, muy franco con la gente, tiene un, un grande corazón y siempre luchando para nuestra comunidad. His book is very powerful. I'm proud that we had him on our radio show. Roxana Guzman is from our radio show. I want to give her a round of applause. Yeah. This is the one up on our podcast. We have an interview with him on our podcast as well, and, and that's available on the website. But the book is very powerful, very timely. And you know right now that in Texas, there are bills that have attacked diversity, equity, and inclusion. This book chronicles how many institutions, even under the affirmative action programs that existed, did not have enough black or Latino candidates or professors, quantifies it in powerful ways. And I also think that brings a lot of history that we may have overlooked and didn't have archived to the fore. The book is timely because it talks about that. Additionally, it talks about how even affirmative action did not do enough. So as affirmative action now has been banned in Texas, we need to find out what we must continue to do to get more Latino and African-American people into these higher institutions. And this book is a powerful read and a handbook on how we can do that. So please welcome a thought leader, a change maker, Dr. Richard Tapia from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Dr. Richard. 
Tony, how long do you want me to talk? Five, Five minutes? Ten minutes? Yeah, okay. So, I want to tell you um, a little bit of my background, and then I'll, I'll talk about the, the talk that I had prepared. Okay? But um, my mother was born in Macapilas. It's the top of the copper canyon, Chihuahua, Chihuahua. Okay? And all the women from Chihuahua are beautiful, and they're all very proud. My mother, at the age of 12, her father said, Magda, you're very smart. I'm sending you to the United States, to Los Angeles, to get an education. But there's one condition, you have to take your sister. So Magda, my mother, was 12. Her sister, Gloria, was 11. And the father sent them by themselves. And they got in trains. They went from Latopilas to Chihuahua, Chihuahua to Juarez, then to Arizona, then to Los Angeles. And that was a dream for her. That's a dream for her. And her heart was full of this desire for education. And she had her sister. Now, they were going to stay with a distant uncle. And when they got there, the distant uncle told my mother and her sister Gloria, my aunt, I don't believe in education for women. You're not going to go to middle school, and you're not going to go to high school. Okay? You're going to go clean houses to pay for your keep. Now, that broke her heart, because she was coming to the United States for education. And she wasn't going to be educated. So she moved in. So she didn't stay with the uncle. She left. And she moved in with a somewhat well-to-do family. And she lived with the family, and she cooked, she took care, I mean, she cleaned, she took care of the children, and this was at the age of 12, until she was married at the age of 20. But she didn't get an education, she didn't go to middle school or high school, but she made enough money working, living with his family to send her sister Gloria, who was one year younger, to live in a boarding school and to go to middle school and high school. So if the dream for her couldn't come true, it was going to come for her sister. And those two women were so close. I mean, they came without family to the United States, an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old. Okay? So my mother dreamed for education. She was not formally educated. She read a lot. She always read. In Batavina, she said that they didn't have electricity, so she would read with candles. And she would read candles every night with candles. Now, my mother, in her way, taught us si se puede, okay? Yes, you belong, and you can do whatever you want to do. You're as good as anybody. So she gave us a feeling of yes, you can, and you belong, okay? And um, so out of the, uh, there were five of us. She got married at 20, and there were five of us. Five of us have bachelor's degrees. Okay. Two of us have law degrees. Okay. My younger brother, who Juliet knows, went to Yale. And he's a law professor right now at Seattle University. My younger sister uh, had a law degree from USC. And she did very well. And I have a PhD. So this mother sort of transferred her incredible desire for education to her children, and she lived vicariously through them. She was very proud. She was incredibly proud. And um, we felt it. See, when I grew up, I never felt that I couldn't. I wasn't a star. I mean, in high school I was a star, but that's because it was probably one of the poorest high schools in Los Angeles. Okay? And I wasn't the best man. I grew up in first grade, second grade, third grade, being the best in the class in mathematics. And it made me, it gave me self-esteem. It gave me a good feeling. I said, look, you can say what you want about Mexicans, but I'm the best math student in this school. Okay? So you have to deal with that. And in high school, 
it was a, a, a similar situation. So I had the feeling that si se puede, I can do it. So when I went to UCLA as a student, it wasn't that I was the best, because I wasn't, but I still felt I could make it. I still felt, I never doubted that I would not get the degree at UCLA, even though I wasn't the best. So that's what she taught us. And, and uh, my father had a similar story, and he didn't go to high school or, okay. So they taught us to believe in ourselves, community and confidence, community and confidence. And so what I say is that um, I grew up, I graduated from high school in 1957, so it was right here, and that's the year that I met uh, my late wife. Now, lots of things were happening, and as we, I, I went to UCLA graduate school in 63. And so I was in graduate school at the heart of the Chicano movement. So we had the Black Panthers with Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, and then we had the Chicano movement. And I am Joaquin, the 14 years old. I was a part of that. So in high school, I didn't know where I fit because the students in school would say to me, Mexican, go back where you came from. But I came from here. My mother said, wait till you go to Mexico and you see where you belong. So when I was 13, we visited Mexico. Immediately they said, green go go home. Green go go home. So I had to say, where do I fit? Where do I fit? So if you, people say to me, are you Mexican? I'd say, no, my mother and father are Mexican. Okay. But I am Chicano. Okay. That's where I grew up. So if you look around here, alrededor del corazón, dice mexicano. But in the center of the corazón, dice chicano. Okay? And that's who I was. So this wasn't something that I was taught and I learned. It's something that I lived. My son's a musician, and, um, and my daughter uh, sings. And they'll ask me, Dad, tell me about the impact of Elvis or the Beatles or the 50s and the music and stuff. Not because I studied it, because I lived it. I lived it. And so I can tell them what it was as I lived it. And that's the same thing with the experience that I have with students. So I'm very effective with students because I've lived the experience. I have been there. I wasn't planning on being you know, an educator. I wanted just to be a mathematician. And my late wife just wanted to be a dancer. And we grew up. We got married very young. She, was, uh, she had just turned 18 and I was 19, and that was uh, 63 years ago. But simple life. I just wanted to be a mathematician, and she just wanted to be a dancer. And then we had a daughter who um, was born on the wings of the state, so she, she really had no choice but to be a dancer. She was really good. But we went through a lot, and I just want to say that People say that which doesn't break you strengthens you. It comes close to breaking. It comes close to breaking. So I'll say that our daughter Cersei, who was 21 and was doing at Rice, in 1982, she was killed by a drunken drug. Jean, who just, she's New Eureka. Jean was New Eureka. And she grew up in New York, and she just loved to dance. Dance. Everything was dance. The whole world was, a, was dance. But in 1977, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The thing that she loved so much was taken away. I can't dance. To take it from me, maybe it would have been a bit more fair. But it was taken away. In 79, my senior rap. In 82, three years later, Cersei was killed. So we went through a lot of adversity. And Jean really wanted to stop living at that point. She said, I can't take it anymore. So I convinced her that she still had things to do. And she um, she started a program. She had a uh, dance school here in Houston with 420 students. She used to teach 21 classes a week. She started a program for people with multiple sclerosis 
in wheelchairs. And the program was called Coming Back. I'm coming back. And it got so so much publicity and visibility that she was a national TV twice. So she came back. And I had, I grew up with cars, so I had my own way of coming back. And that was building a show car. We bought the 1970 Chevelle Malibu SL. It was three times national champion. And that was my way of coming back. Because in dealing with Cersei's death, yeah, I didn't want to talk to people. I just wanted to get into an activity that I could put my heart and head into, but not having to talk to people. So we went through a lot. So when I talk to students, so yesterday I gave, let's say yesterday I gave two talks to teachers and high school students. And today this is the third talk I gave. Okay, so that's five in two days. But I love it. And I love the fact that you're here. I mean, to me, you know, as I was walking, trying to find this building and trying to find this place, I kept cussing Tony out. <laughs> 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 you know, if I didn't love him so much, I would just you know, tell him that. But we got here. And I so much appreciate that you're here. Okay? That makes me feel really good. But in my heart, I'm a mathematician. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this book. I didn't study things. I lived them. So in a certain sense, this is an opening to my life and the things that I lived along the way. And uh, an opening message because of the uh, Supreme Court's action on, on affirmative action. I would say that affirmative action should not be dropped in admissions. Indeed, it should be expanded to include social and academic support programs. Affirmative action comes with two problems. Okay? One is the admissions. But you can't just say, okay, we're admitting you, and then we're going to leave you. It has to have support programs. Without the SOAR programs, it's not going to work. And that's what the university is going to appreciate, is that we need social and academic support programs. And um, one of my favorite students at Rice of all times, I have many. But certainly one of them from the years back is Julia Stepesh. And she did so well. And I said, if there are students like Juliet, I have to give my time. My hardest thing in life has been the balance between being a mathematician. Okay? I love being a mathematician. And being an outreach person. Okay? In other words, I can't just do outreach and people will say, he's a professional. I have to keep the balance between research and outreach. One time I had an invitation to, uh, in Washington to give a talk. And Juliet was the director of the Top Center. Right? And Juliet was there. And I said, Juliet, you give the talk. Right? And she did, and it was wonderful. Right? She was a great speaker. Now, I give a lot of talks. I give a lot of talks, more than anybody at Rice. And a lot of people give the same talks, like Stephen Kleinberg, over and over. But I give different talks. This week I'm giving five talks on different topics. And I enjoy it. I enjoy it. OK, so anyway, the students, I love the students, be them any age. Well, I don't like to work with toddlers. <laughs> So in this talk, I will highlight notions from the book that work against the promotion of equitable representation of students and faculty in science and engineering in today's top universities. While many examples will come from Rice, I do not mean to imply that Rice is worse than our other sister cities. We're all equally bad concerning equitable representation. And I want to, um, Tony referred to something, and I have a page here. Let me see if I can uh, hear it. Okay. An example of the failure. Okay, so we have students and then we have faculty. Now it is interesting that most universities, the best job they do is the undergraduates. Like the University of Texas, Austin. Many of you may have it as your favorite school. Okay. They do a good job, undergraduates. 
in science and engineering. Terrible job for graduate students, and non-existent job on faculty. Okay? So undergraduates, UT Austin has done well. Graduate students, and I mean underrepresented minorities, I mean black and brown. Terrible. A&M, worse. Okay? So the faculty. So here's some data that I have on the chart. And I take the 100 best universities in science and engineering, and I give you the percentage of the faculty that is either black or brown. So let's take the 100 best universities in mathematics. Okay? What percentage of the faculty of the 100 uh, best university is Hispanic? 1.5 percent. What about uh, black? 1.7 percent. What about Asian? 17 percent. Okay, now let me jump down. I can give you all of them, but let me jump down to electrical engineering. Electrical engineering percentage of blacks on the faculty is 1.8. That's black. Now Hispanics is 1.7. Asian on the faculty in electrical engineering is 29%. So we as Hispanics are here. We're here. I see you, but we're not there. We're not there. I have so many firsts, not to brag, but I, I was the first Hispanic in the United States to be elected to the National Academy of Engineering. I was the first and only Hispanic to win a National Medal of Science. And Rice had the, uh, the highest positions called university professor. I'm the only Hispanic. So it's, being first is bittersweet. Because it's nice to say, ah, I'm first. But it's bittersweet because it all should have happened so long ago. It shouldn't be so late. It shouldn't be so late. 1992, the first Hispanic to National Academy of Engineering, that was me. It should have been in the 60s. It should have been in the 70s, okay? but it wasn't. Okay. So um, we're not there. And you don't, well, you see people talk about affirmative action at the undergraduate level. Okay? And that's what we had in, uh, our administrators would say. At the faculty level, there's no affirmative action for underrepresented minorities in science and engineering. The, all those zeros are still there. On the other hand, I am proud to say that women are moving forward. Women are moving forward in science and engineering on their faculty. There's no doubt about it. They're moving forward. Now, the distinction is that I make a big distinction. In fact, I'll get there, but let me make it, let me see what else I have on here before I get to that. Um, okay. Let me just say this. We seem not to make a distinction between international or foreign women faculty and domestic. In other words, gender dominates nationality. So if you really look at the faculties of, of, the, of the good universities, the best you can, in science and engineering, you'll see a good percentage of women. But they're not domestic women. They're not women that grew up in Houston. They're not women that grew up in Los Angeles. They're from China. They're from other places. In our faculty, we have two women right now. We had three. Not one of them is from the United States. Okay. But people don't make that distinction. They just say, that's fine. But as a role model, you're not giving our young women role models. Okay. How much of a big difference? On the other hand, it makes a big difference with underrepresented minorities. Universities say, look, oh, you want a brown that has a Spanish accent? that has a mustache, that has dark hair. We have somebody from Colombia. 
We have somebody from Argentina. We have somebody from Chile. Bring them in. And that's what's killing today's universities in terms of the faculty, is that we are replacing the dos besti, like Richard Kapian, okay, with people from other countries. Now, the people from other countries, they're not against them. We should hire them. But we should use them in terms of the affirmative action uh, or the underrepresentation quotas. Do they, are they good faculty? Yes. Do they do good mathematics or engineering? Yes. But they don't understand who I am. When I was at UCLA, the first thing I would see is a faculty member in the math department who came from Argentina. I would run away because the first thing that they would do is want to speak Spanish completely. And my Spanish was an unpar with theirs. So we go along and I could do okay. But then I got into your technical things and I was very uncomfortable. So one of the things that you see in the book is I talk about I, the, the international Hispanic from other countries did not serve as a role model for me. I needed somebody made of the same fabric that I was made of. Okay? And there was one Chicano faculty named David Sanchez. And I really turned to him. So what happens is that we are, the problem in the country is they are trying to bring domestic black, domestic Hispanic, and domestic women into faculties. Okay? But we're not doing it. With the domestic black and brown, we replace them with foreign, international, whatever you want to say. And with the women, we do the same thing. So an American axiom that I say, there is value in improving the representation of underrepresented minorities. Everybody says that, okay? What is the value? And who are underrepresented minorities? That's a big thing. What's the value and who's an underrepresented minority? You're one, you're one, you're one, you're one. Everybody's one, okay? Now, here's the problem. America cannot maintain its economic and scientific health when an identifiable large part of the population is left out, left out of the mainstream activities in the science and engineering. Hence, the best way to view STEM underrepresentation is as a phenomenon that endangers the health of the nation. The health of the nation. Far more than it endangers the health of the various scientific disciplines. You think mathematics is going to die because there's no brown and no black? But the country, it would have no STEM, no women in STEM, no blacks in STEM, no brown in STEM, as that population gets growing and growing. The country will suffer, be an economic danger. The country will suffer if we don't bring these people in. And that's what, um, what is happening. Okay? Um, so if you wanted to identify underrepresented groups, You'd have domestic Hispanics, you'd have African Americans, you'd have Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders. But the population, Native Americans, 2%. Pacific Islanders is half of 1%. So we're really talking about domestic black and domestic brown. Are they on faculty? And are they playing leadership role? And the answer is no. <laughs> I have it here in bold print. International blacks and Hispanics have absolutely nothing to do with the nation's underrepresentation problem. I don't want the dean at Rice telling me, look what we've done. We have two people from Argentina and one from Chile and whatever, three from Brazil. Okay. I want to know how many people from Houston, Los Angeles, Detroit, Chicago. That's what the country is about. That's who I am. That's who I am. And so I go round and round on those issues. Okay. So we've been playing this game for a long time. Um, let me see what I can hear. Um, so including non-domestic blacks and Hispanics in the category underrepresented minority serves to exacerbate the representation problem. And whenever I say that, they don't like it. Our dean at Rice and I fight all the time. Okay? I'm a pain. They, Juliet taught me how to be. <laughs> but I tell the administration, you know, 
Can I fight with our president? With our deeds? And that very reminded me, in fact, you reminded me a minute ago. I said to my wife, my late wife, Jane, do you think I'm a pain? And she said, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> I think that you are a pain. So the past president of Rice, David Lieber, he came up to me and he said, we have been very good to you. Rice has been really good to you. And my answer to him was, but I've been better. And I uh, really mean that. Now, we tend to evaluate, not on the global picture, but on how much research you can do. We're very research intensive at um, research universities. And it's, um, I, um, in the 70s, Stanford was looking at me. They said, oh, you're an uprising underrepresented we might hire you. So I went to Stanford for a year, and I did great things. I was faculty advisor to a lot of groups. Um, I had three classes, and I got perfect evaluations in all classes. Stanford teachers are not good, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and um, they came to whether they were going to hire And here's what they did. In 1976, see, I was made full professor at Rice, and I had tenure since 1972. So Stanford says, well, we're not sure that you're good enough for us. So in 76, when I was full professor at Rice, they said, we will offer you associate professor without tenure. Okay? Well, I couldn't do that. So I told them, um, see, those of you from Texas, progressive country, Jerry Jeff Walker, Pinky Friedman, David Allen Coe. There's a David Allen Coe song that says, take this job and shut it. I'm not working here anymore. So that's what I told Stanford. I'm not coming to Stanford. But they were wrong because I eventually won all these awards, including the National Medal of Science, and Stanford were taken great pride in that. Berkeley, the same thing. They weren't sure. They weren't sure whether Richard Cotton was really good enough for Berkeley. Okay? He's good, but we're not sure if he's really good enough. Okay? And um, so I gave a math talk at Berkeley after I saw that they were not going to hire me. And the title of my talk was, Why You Would Never Hire Me, Even Though I Would Give You More Than 95% of Your Faculty. But You Wouldn't Hire Me. So my epitaph will say, Never Berkeley, but almost Stanford. <laughs> Our faculty hiring is flawed. We emphasize research at the expense of all health. At the expense of all health. So I knew that I had to get tenure. Can you really can't fire you. So when I started Rice in 1970, I said, there was, in the 70s, there was this activity called hire to fire. Hire to fire. So let's say you had one slot. And this happened. the United States Department of Justice investigated uh, Bertha for this. They had one slot for a minority. And they hired five minorities, five underrepresented minorities. And then at the end of the year, they fired four. But nobody counted how many they fired. They just counted how many they hired. So Berkeley looked good. Okay? The Texas Center, yeah, the medical center, was doing the same thing. I had a friend, two dear friends, <coughs> who were hired. And I told my dear friend, his name was Ted, they're hiring you to fire you. Richard, they would never do that. They wouldn't do that. They're really nice people. In one year, he was fired. Boom, he was gone. Okay. So I said to myself, get tenure. I learned. I think my mother taught us how to survive. Get tenure. 
Two years. I got tenure in two years at Rice, from 70 to 72. That's probably a record. But that's not what I want to brag about. What I want to brag about was I had the understanding that if I wanted to play the game, I had to protect myself and have tenure. And I did. Then the balance. The balance came up between research and um, between research and outreach. Okay? To this day, to this day I have that balance. Okay? But it really helped. I get invitations, for example, like I had an invitation from MIT, or I had one from Caltech, not long ago. Now, why do they invite me? Because they say National Medal of Science, National Academy of Engineering. So they say, Richard Tapia cannot be a total jerk. Okay? Because how else would he have won all these awards? So here's what I do to MIT and to Caltech. I say, I'll come and give a talk only if I'm introduced by the president. And then they say, oh, we weren't planning that. Then I was planning not to give a talk. <laughs> <laughs> and in both cases, the president introduced me. And we had a great time. But I put it to them. I said, you want me? And I had that leverage. OK, so yeah, so I am a pain. <laughs> I am a pain. Now, I want to say one thing that um, I know it, it's some time to, to quit, but um, one of the things that happens at school, and in fact, I'll talk about rice, is underrepresented minority students, okay, domestic Latinos, domestic African, African Americans. They come in to major in electrical engineering, computer science, mathematics, physics, all the STEM activities. But then the faculty drives them away. So they don't make the distinction between poor preparation and poor talent. You look at somebody and you say, and I hope that that's what happened with me at UCLA. Poor preparation, not poor talent and they stuck with me. So what happens is that these schools, the faculty will tell the minority, you can transfer, you can go to another school. We see that all the time. So let's talk about retention within engineering. NACME, the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, did a study. Retention in engineering for underrepresented minorities, retention for non underrepresented minorities. So, in this study, the school that was number one in the country was Northwestern, with 80% retention for minorities and 92% for non minorities. That's number one in the country. Now, there, I could go down, there were 117 school studies, and Rice came out 96. So I'm saying some bad things now about Bryce. Bryce minority retention in engineering was 30% for minorities. For non-minorities, it was 84%. That was one of the highest in the country. So Bryce was not retaining. So what happens is that Bryce would retain its minority students, but not in intended major. So you want to say, I'm coming in physics, I'm coming in math coming in, in electrical engineering. But then you see transfer to the other side of campus, which is the French side, and they end up in political science, sociology, and psychology. So we're losing a potential of minorities that could be very promising for the benefit and the health of the nation. Okay? That's what we're losing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you that Rice was worse than our other our sister cities in retaining underrepresented minorities in engineering. Okay. It was very likely that many of these uh, migrated students, migration from STEM to the friendly side of campus, would be practicing engineers today had they not chosen rights. And I say that at rights, but I have tenure. They can just say. Neil Lane told me one. You rig? He was a pro. Richard, you make my life very uncomfortable. And 
I said, isn't that good? <laughs> isn't that good? Okay? That's what your job is for. And um, when I was on the National Science Board, I was a bill sign appointee to the National Science Board. The director of the National Science uh, Foundation said to me, you make my life very difficult. Again, isn't that good? I am so happy. So um, I'm going to stop. I have some data here that says this. I took a survey on Rice faculty. And I'm, I'm pointing to Rice because I know Rice. Not because Rice is so far worse than anybody else. But I asked the faculty, um, question number one was, does preparation for minority students depend on quality of the undergrad? institution. 80% said yes. Okay, that's good. That's fine. Does mentoring under represent minority require a lot of time? 40% said yes. Are underrepresented minorities prepared for graduate work? 30% said yes. Are underrepresented minorities hard workers? Do they work as hard as the other students? 20% said yes. But here's the kicker. Underrepresented minorities, do underrepresented minorities possess talent in their field of study? 6% of the faculty said yes. So they're going in with lower expectations. And the fact is, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? And um, I could go on and on and on, but you don't want me to. But I do want to say this. One of the reasons, I want to say this, and I'm up here, and only Tony can stop me, but he's not. Um, <laughs> so, when I won the National Medal of Science, I didn't feel that I belonged. You know, there's this imposter syndrome. These are the best mathematicians and engineers in the world. And they were my heroes. And I was put in with that group. And I said to Jane, my wife, I don't belong. And she said, Richard, not only do you belong, you're the best. You're the best. Okay. And I said, Jane, you don't know. You don't know. And I mean it. That, you know, how did I get there? Okay. Now, President Obama came out, and there's two things I want to say about President Obama. He said, they read my name, the Marine Sergeant read my name, and um, the Richard Obama. And President Obama came to give me the award. No. But he said, Richard Tapia had given the young call of duty. All six of you have given good research to the country, but Richard Tapia had given things that are critical for the health of the nation, including representation of women and men. That was President Obama. Okay. That's good. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Yeah. Now, this is my last thing. My wife, Jane, I told you she's New York, and uh, Paris and Puerto Rico. She was born in and Jane was in a wheelchair, right there in the first row. And a woman came out and said, President Obama does not like you to yell. So please clap and don't yell. Mm -hmm. And um, the Marine Sergeant says, he, look, he came out. And if you grow up in this country, and you say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, if they hail to the scene. It's got to bring goosebumps to your arms. Okay? So that's what they did. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And if they hail to the scene. Then the Marine Sergeant said, National Medal of Science, Richard Johnson. Now, Jean's went in a wheelchair. And she jumps, and she screams, and she makes noise. Everybody in the room could hear. 
So President Obama looked at me and he said, is that your wife? <laughs> and I said, you know, that's my wife. And uh, he said, oh. Then I said to him, she's Puerto Rican. And all Puerto Ricans are loud. <laughs> and so he thought that was cool. Then that night, Jean told me, Richard, you knew I was going to yell. My side won. My side won. I had to. Yes, Jean, I knew that you were going to yell. And she did. And that was a great moment. I just wish my mother had been alive for that particular time. But I'm going to stop. And I'm going to say that, you know, I didn't follow what I had planned, but I followed what I just wanted to share with you. Okay? And you have to ask questions. I always judge audiences by the question. Do we test them with big questions, Professor? Of course, that's what I'm going to do. I'll let you call them. I want, I want to loud, by hearing it, I haven't already heard you. So I want you to say it loud. Yeah, that's a great idea. You're yeah. Not, yeah, I'm really in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? Yes, it is. Test, test, test. I, no, I stop. I stop. I will be compadre with this hand with Anthony now. Yes. I do want to throw in the only three questions. Thank you for this uh, wonderful evening and great event. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, part of my experience, I was an engineering major in California, uh, and there was a program at the time for retention, this is back in the 90s, uh, and it was called the MAP program, it's a minority engineering program, it was focused on retention. So, uh, to your point, it was an undergrad program. Is there something that is happening maybe at Rice, at the graduate level, or maybe at the faculty level, that is retention focused? Because even in my corporate life, um, you know, we had a Hispanic forum in our corporation for the same purpose for retention because the numbers are the numbers, the data is the data. And it would show lots of hiring and then bloop, you know, five year after a five year run, a big drop off. So the answer is I run retention for underrepresented minority graduates. Okay. So does Rice do anything? No. I do. And in fact, I think when I win a lot of these awards, it's because how well I do. Okay? I do very well. So, in a, a, a gap, which is Elias from graduate education and professor, I was in charge of that program for 11 years. And we produced in STEM 89 underrepresented minority PhDs, more than anybody in the country. I have produced 60 women PhDs more than anybody in the country. So it takes a champion. And I'm here to say, if I got into it, I really jumped in with both the and the thing we did. But was it part of the, was it institutionalized or was it part of the structure? No, because nobody was holding them accountable. Okay? So whenever I listen to somebody talk about a particular school, the two things I say, one, I don't want to know how many you accepted. I want to know how many you retained, how many graduated. Okay? And I also want to know how you're doing with faculty and graduates. And faculty, see, all universities just come underrepresented minorities as anybody that is Hispanic in some way or another. Okay? And, and so, sure, people from Argentina and whatever, Cuba. Puerto Rico, Chile account. So the answer is no. Universities are not held accountable for that at all. Okay, and nobody cares. I mean, nobody seems to care. I care, and I, I um, I have fun. I have fun. Um, I was asked to be on a committee at MIT. Now the president at MIT is from Venezuela. And I made a distinction between foreign and domestic minorities, and we would fight back and forth. Finally, I wrote a beautiful letter and I resigned from the committee. Okay? And it, it's, it's in my book. And it, it, my letter is in the book. Okay? 
And I said, this is wrong. Okay. Sometimes the best thing I have done is resign from a committee with a beautiful letter. That was good. Okay. So no, the answer to your question, no, nobody cares. Do you think, do you think, and I'm looking at you, okay, do you think that the faculty really cares that we don't have that many black or brown domestic graduate students? Do you think they care? They want somebody that can help them in their research. Get me somebody who works really hard, with great work habits, and doesn't ask a lot of questions, okay? And that's the Chinese graduates, okay? And the thing is very, very much in demand because they work very, very hard. But trying to fix the country, if it costs you something, is not worth it. Why do I do it? Because I care. And I get to meet wonderful people like y'all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to go over to my colleague, uh, Professor Christopher Hossa from Moonstar College, Houston North. So first of all, I want, I want to thank Tony. And, so I want to thank Tony and Wesley Balaba for host for bringing bringing Dr. Babka here. Thank uh, HTC also for hosting. This is great. Uh, so my name is Christopher Hossa. I'm a professor with Tony at Lone Star College, uh, Houston North, for the new newest and smallest. Uh, and I most know. diverse uh, and most Hispanic. And, uh, no, I've given talk to both. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, and I've been friends with Juliet for 25 years, and, and so we decided to get together. And, yeah, exactly. But um, so I also I'm the, uh, I teach English with, with Tony, all kinds, um, and I'm also the Puente program chair. Puente is a program out of California that is designed to to um, improve success and retention of underrepresented groups, and specifically, as you, as you talked about, domestic groups. And so. Given that we're here, given that so many of, of our underrepresented minorities uh, and groups of all kinds start at community college, that we're really trying to increase our STEM involvement and participation. I wonder what you see as the as the future and the involvement of community college within the lives of the educational track of these students that we can start them on the right path so that we're not losing them. Absolutely. I went to community college for two years. I told you. I mean, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> in fact, when I was in high school, there were no counselors telling me that I should go to college. I was a really good student, but nobody was learning. So I went to work, and I was working packing fiberglass and muffins in, in the hot sun, the California sun, you know, hot 80 degrees. Boom, boom, boom. And there's one fellow from Mississippi, Jim, he said, Richard, you're smart for college, for college, for college. By September of that summer, I said, okay, I'm going to run the community college. And it was really good. It automatically lifted me to UCLA. Okay? And that was really good. And a lot of my friends who had doctorates and got doctorates started in community college. But in California, it was very easy to transfer. In other words, they said, oh, if you have a 2.4, um, you're almost automatically in. And I um, actually, when I went to UCLA, they told me, well, you could have gotten in out of high school. I don't know what I told you. But that's OK. And, and anyway, absolutely, we have to work that. But you have to, you have to make the students believe in themselves. You have to make the students believe in themselves, that they're not second rate and they can go. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to use your catchphrase, confidence in community. That's my cue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. No, I had a lot of fun in community college. So I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we cut you off on the sheet and your question. What's up, man? I, I really enjoyed it. Amazing, amazing. I think about it. Hey, um, my question is um what what are, what are the top three things you would say that allowed you to be a world class mathematician? Okay, that's a, that's an excellent question. It's not that I'm, see, when I teach Rice classes, okay, and I, I'll teach two, okay, I look at the students, and I said, three quarters of you at least are smarter than I am. You look out about it. And that doesn't bother me. Okay, you're smart. But if you succeed at the level that I have, that's going to be a great accomplishment. Okay? So I'm telling them that their intelligence alone is not going to take them. Okay? So, 
you have to believe that you can and follow that path, okay? I always believed I could. My mother taught me that. Yes, you can, okay? I won't be the best, but I'll be good enough, okay? So one other thing is to believe in yourself, self-esteem, and confidence. That's one. The other thing is, you know, there's no magic button. You gotta work hard, okay? Here I am in my 80s, and I'm working as hard as I did in my 20s. Okay? And the fact is that I work hard, and I'm used to it, I like it, and I'm writing three books. And you gotta work hard. You have to work hard. Okay? And so, and I like challenges. For example, I had two talks last night, and I had two today, and now this is the third. I like giving talks. And so somebody says, can you give a talk? And if I think the audience is interesting, like I think you're all beautiful, okay, I say, absolutely. So, believe in yourself, work very hard, and here's another thing that I say. I've been very lucky to run with the big dogs, okay? When I had a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin, in UCLA, I was with the world's best mathematicians, and they accepted me as a colleague. I.J. Schoenberg, Barclay Rossett, they said, they didn't try to make anything, and, and there was no vibing. It was just, come on in and join us. So I went and ran with big dogs. So if you sit on the porch with big dogs, you have to bark like a big dog. Okay? And if you bark like a big dog, the world will accept you as a big dog. Okay? So I get accepted as a big dog, and sometimes it humbles me. Okay? But then I go back and I say, no, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> I think we got more questions. Let's we'll do two more. Yeah. Um, thank you for the for the words, Dr. Tapia. I'm a teacher in South Houston, and my kids have talked about you because I think one of our counselors is also here. I sent kids to your program. I, I really thought that what you said about being poor preparation versus poor talent was particularly important and knowing that our kids are going to a lot of junior colleges like Lone Star and especially some of the programs that have been set with like for example Pasadena ISD and San Jacinto College, uh, Goose Creek and Lee College, a lot of our brown and black kids are going to those schools and then somehow it's it become very much of a, of a challenge getting them to go to the next step because a lot of those schools right. push them towards uh, locations, which there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we need. You're right. You're absolutely right. See? And when I was in California, it wasn't that way. As I mentioned to you, I had community college friends, colleagues, where a bunch of us went to UCLA, and a bunch of us got PhDs. Okay? You have to believe. You know, you're already told all your life, if you're an underrepresented minority, that you're not as good as the rest. So you certainly don't want to catch them in believing that. You have to believe that you're very good. I had this one professor, his name was Stuart Freeman, okay, in mathematics. And I don't know how many times I've given, so I don't remember if I've said this or not. But he came up to me and he said, Richard, where are you going to uh, four years school? Long Beach State, I think, maybe one of the states go. I want you to go to UCLA. You're going to fit into UCLA, and it's going to be good for you. He didn't say much, but he said, I want you to go to UCLA. So I said, fine. I don't know where it is, but I'll find it. <laughs> and I went to UCLA. And that made such a difference. So remember the worker that I had named Jim when we were packing fiberglass? He said, go to college. And Stuart Friedman said, go to UCLA. And David Sanchez, a professor at UCLA, go into academia. We're going to get you a position postdoc at this hospital. So a lot of people have said critical things to me at the right time. At the right time. Just one thing. You don't have to spend and hold hands with the student. You have to say something. Like I have two students that I'm thinking of. And in fact, one is Joseph Sequentes and one is Juan Rodriguez. And I asked them, are you going to go to graduate school? And they say, oh no, I don't think I'm good enough. I said, so you're good enough. You're good enough. You're good enough. You're good enough. Go. And they both went, they both got PhDs, and both did very well. Somebody has to believe in you and tell you. You don't have to hold their hand, you just have to say it. Okay? 
I was waiting for somebody to tell me. I thought I was good. My mother thought I was good. My wife thought I was good. So I just wanted a teacher or somebody to tell me, you're good. Okay. But I don't think I found them. Anyway. I think that this answer was the perfect segue into what I wanted to ask about, and it's solutions. How do each of us become an amplifier or a voice for actually making that happen, convincing somebody? I, I love hearing about your rich history and what you've done and what you've experienced, but now how do each of us walk out of here today and start convincing our fellow Latinos and brown people who aren't interested in trying it out. What you started to say right now, like, tell them that you believe in them, but what else? What else can we literally yeah, but see, start to do? When you have a conversation with a student, okay, that student can read your face. That student can read your face. And all you need to do is, is don't make them think that you're saying things you really don't believe. Okay. I had a, a friend named Jim Thompson. Did you, did you know Jim Thompson? Okay. Anyway, he was in the office next to me, and he wore glasses, and whenever a student would come in, he would take off his glasses and start cleaning like this, okay? And the next thing I know, these are usually women, the woman would be crying. So I said, Thompson, you did it again. You did watch the facial expressions. You didn't know what you were saying and how it was impacting the student. I watch facial expressions, and I see, oh, oh. I'm going to back off on that stuff. So I agree with you. But the thing is, there is this thing about, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, in the last six months, there were two students in our department that I am not their advisor. I don't advise students anymore. I just, they have a book, okay? But two women called me and said, should I talk to you? And I didn't really know them well, but both of them said to me, I'm not a good fit with my advisor. Okay? Can you help me decide what to do? And in um, one case, I brought in the advisor, and I said, I told him, she wasn't there. It's like marriage, okay? it's gotta be a good fit. And right now, the fit between you and the school is not good, so you need to change it. And he claimed that he has changed it, and she seems to be happy. With the other student, we changed their advisors. Okay? And uh, I said, that's not going to work. All my life, I've done that with some students. I'd say, I'm going to try to do, to help you. Okay? And so I have students come to my office all the time. And they just come in and they say, oh, I just want to talk to you if I had this problem, I had this problem. And sometimes it's, um, I remember one student. Um, it was a long time ago. Anyway, she said she was having marital problems. And she said, "Can you uh, advise me on my marital problems?" And I said, "Well, I've been married a long time, so let's talk." Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. But you can be upbeat. You can be upbeat. When I talk to these high school students, like I did yesterday and today, they believe in me. They believe that I'm real, okay, and I tell personal stories, okay? And I want it to be that way. I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe in me. And I've had professors that didn't believe in me. So be it. Thank you very much, Richard. And I appreciate you being so generous with your brilliance. Now I'm going to notice something. The evening began with Richard cussing me out. <laughs> but then he called me beautiful. Yeah. He called us all very beautiful. <laughs> and uh, we're all going to get a chance to hear your individual story with Richard. What does that mean? That means that this is not just a book. It's not, we're not a corporate bookstore. What I want you to do is when you get this copy, when you meet Richard, when you put your name in it, this is the story your family library. When folks come over, you're going to grab this book and you say, you know what? I was there when he spoke. Here's what he said. Here's what he said to me. And we need you to do this right now because there are actors.
active forces keeping books out of the hands of our community. It's going on right now like it did 10 years ago, and like it might again in 10 years, but we'll be here 10 years ago. We were here 10 years ago. We'll be here 10 years from now doing this on our terms. And uh, so right now then, in a little bit, when you buy this book, once you know, proceeds go to Nuestra Palabra. Uh, Roland Garcia just texted me and said he couldn't make it, um, but he wanted me to buy, I'm gonna buy his copy, you're gonna sign it for him, so I encourage you to do that as gifts. And the last thing we're gonna do, before we go, Mark Cedric is gonna come up here and beg for his job back, because not one survey's been filled out yet. So, <laughs> two, 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 never mind. Oh, three, four, never mind, good job. Thank you, Mark. Representing the Alma survey, the survey guy, Mark Cedric. I need you to sell it. Okay, so sell it. All right, all right, just check. All right, so everybody take out your pens and put a big X through the QR code, okay? We had some technical difficulties because we made some updates to the survey. And so with the updates comes a new link. And with a new link, you need a new QR code. So go ahead and put an X there. Go ahead and bring out your phones, okay? We're doing some call to action here, all right? So everybody pull out your phone, scan the QR code, please. You don't have to fill it out right now. It might take five to 10 minutes to fill out. Finish it later. This is good enough, but if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the mission, then go ahead and fill that out, the, the more lengthy one, okay? Can I stand up? Can y'all hear me well? Okay, so another call to action, just uh, real quick. So I'm, I'm on board with Tony Diaz. He's been a real light in, uh, in my life. I've been watching him speak since I was a little guy. You know, I'm 24 years old. I've known him since I was probably like um, seven years old or something. I started seeing him speak. And uh, you know, thank you, Richard, for, for all the awesome messages you shared today. That's, that's what we do. You know, we, sh we share messages with the people. Like my shirt says, why not be a light? Why not be a light in the world, right? So uh, Richard is a light, Tony's a light, and I know a lot of you guys are are also sharing your light with your unique gifts. So um, keep on doing that. You know, us, us youngsters are watching you guys. You guys are leaders, and soon we'll be the leaders, you know, in a few years. So uh, keep on raising us up, right? Keep on being a light to us. Have patience with us, because we make mistakes. You know, I know, you know a lot of teachers here. It gets frustrating, it gets hard, but uh, I'm about to be a teacher myself, so. Like I said, I'm going to be an educational leader coming soon. So, thank you, man. And so, this survey is going to help big time. You see right here, you can read. We care about what you think. Please take a few minutes to let us know how we can better serve you at future events. We're going to have a lot more future events coming. So, you guys also have the calendar there with a few upcoming. So, stay tuned with what, what we're doing with this mission and uh, keep on being a light world. All right? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to have second generation generation Nuestra Palabra folks. His mom is Mariana, uh, Mariana um, Cortez, who's a wonderful poet. And I'm jesting. I know he's resilient. He's tough. He's strong. And I'm joking with him, but you just told us that we got to tell people uh, how, how wonderful they are. So I want to make it clear. Not only do I tell them, when you're one of our crew, when you're one of my team, for sure, we work you to death for free for, for 10 years. <laughs> and if we can pay you, we know you're the right person. But I also, when our crew needs letter of recommendations, when I write that letter of recommendation for my volunteer, I know that whoever reads that, they're gonna weep and thank that person for applying, okay? Because that's how we roll, we pass the baton. And I'm very glad for all the other people that worked with us, all the folks from before. Our dear friend Holly is a candidate for city council, former school board member. Mr. Palabra is a 501c3. We cannot endorse a candidate. All I can do is give you a fact. She's here today with you, buying books, hanging out as she was before. That is all for now. I want to thank Elena Lopez. Uh, I want to thank the folks from Alma. I want to thank Kissimmee College and all the sponsors as well. Look forward to convening with you. And then um, uh, please do buy your book. Do get it signed. And please get one of the cameras. Thank you for all your support. Gracias. Thank you.